Hello Watch Enthusiasts! Now in today's video I'd like to continue the history which I started in my last video about the story of dive watches and their technical development through the years. And in that video I spoke about the early days of dive watches all the way through to the mid-1960s when companies such as Comex and indeed navies such as the US Navy were starting to experiment with longer, st longer stays underwater using more and more exotic gas mixtures for their divers to breathe at greater depths. And so naturally this, this played a great role in terms of the development of dive watches when new technologies were necessary. And do note that uh, in this video I will continue through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and indeed to the present day with all the watches which I feel have caused the greatest change in terms of their, uh, their technical development of dive watches. Now as I stated at the start of the other video, I won't be talking about the popular culture surrounding dive watches in this video, but rather I'm going to be focusing primarily on the technical changes and the evolution of dive watches. Whilst I won't be talking about every dive watch that came out by any stretch, I'd like to focus on some of the most important ones which really advanced technology and our understanding of deep sea diving. If you would like to know something about these watches in more detail, then do follow the links throughout the video to videos I've made specifically about the watches in this, this uh, larger, more large scale video, where I go go into the very, very fine details about these watches, the sizes, the movements, the depth ratings, and so on, for more detail, and for simply a bit more information if you're interested. Now in the last video I finished with the point that in 1964's uh, Sea Lab 1 and 1965's Sea Lab 2, US Navy divers were realising their Rolex Submariner 5512s were suffering with problems as a result of helium. And what happened with these watches was that upon decompression, as a result of the fact they were under uh, saturation diving, and as a result were remaining underwater for many days, their watches would, uh, would blow their crystals out. And the reason for this was the fact that during these, these deep sea dives, which at this point went down to about 60 metres, the mix of gases that the divers were having to breathe was uh, helium and oxygen, and indeed in, in some other missions it was um, he heliox, um, indeed there was um, hydrox as well, where they, they breathe hydrogen as well. But during these, these, uh, these dives, because of the high pressure inside the diving bell, inside their, uh, their, their living quarters, some of this helium, as a result of being a very small molecule, would penetrate the case and, uh, and would pass, uh, pass the seals of the watch. And what this meant was that uh, this, this helium would enter the case under pressure. So when one surfaced again and depressurized, this, uh, this, uh, this helium, which was held under pressure inside the watch, would burst through the front of the watch in order to, to release the pressure which it had gained. And so this was a problem in terms of losing the crystals of watches and having quite violent explosions. And so obviously a change had to be made to these watches to be able to accommodate this new world of, of advanced diving. Now with the ever increasing demand for these exploratory dives, there were a few solutions to this, uh, this inherent problem with the dive watch concept. And the most obvious and indeed perhaps the most, um, the, the, the most successful was the use of a case with a helium escape valve. And this was pioneered by Doxa and by Rolex in the late 60s, with Rolex finishing um, a, a watch first, although there is a proviso to that, which I will uh, talk about in, uh, later on in the video. And they released their first in 1967, just after applying for a patent on this technology. And this was the Rolex 1665 Sea Dweller. Now in 67, it was very much the single Sea Dweller, which was the prototype. This model had some, sometimes had a helium escape valve whilst other models didn't, and it had a water resistance of 500 metres, or about 1,640 feet. Now it's known as the single red because it had one line of red text on the dial, and didn't have a cyclops as a result of this not being able to resist the increased pressure on the thickened case, as well as having a thickened crystal. Now it was used in 67 um, it, as, a, uh, as a dive watch in this form, but by 1969, when, uh, when the, the famous Sea Lab 3 mission went underway, it was in its full 600 metre water resistant or 2,000 foot water resistant two line of text red sea dweller. And this doesn't suggest that there was any change to the watch's technology, but simply that they'd re-rated it at that full 600 metre water resistance. And these had the helium escape valve. And these effectively made extremely complex versions of a normal Submariner, which had been beefed up to be able to take the extra resistance required of these watches, which during Sea Lab 3 were exposed to Heliox and taken down to 185 metres. Now it should be noted though that after Rolex produced this watch in the late 1960s and continued on through the 70s, they did start a full partnership with Comex in terms of, um, of, of using their watches for their dives and their exploration. And as a result, it should be noted that the Sea Dweller wasn't the only Rolex that used a helium escape valve, because they did produce custom Submariner 5513s, which were the no-date versions for Comex for lower water-resistant models. 
And uh, originally these were 5513s in the early 70s, um, around 1972, for example, they produced these 5513s. But they later gave Comex a completely, uh, completely uh, unique reference, which was the 5514. And these were versions with Comex on the dial in many occasions, um, and as a result had a 200 meter water resistance, um, didn't have the date, but did have a helium escape valve in the same place as the Sea Dweller. Now the helium escape valve with Rolex was of course used since 67, but was in fact only really available by 1971 to 1972. And so as a result, the, the Doxa 300T Conquistador from 1969 beats it to the position of being the, the first accessible watch with a helium escape valve. Because this watch uh, fit, was fitted uh, with the same sort of uh, style of, of tonneau case and the same extremely important and very functional bezel with dial as, um, as the earlier 300T. Uh, but in this case, it was fitted with a helium escape valve on the other side of the case in order to allow it to decompress and in order to allow, allow it to be a more competent dive watch for a wider application and to be a, a similarly extremely functional watch. Of course, it continued the same style of dial and that iconic Doxa form with the same 300 meter water resistance. But it did allow divers um, who wanted to, uh, to work um, away from the, the Rolex ecosystem, if you will, away from the Rolex brand, or indeed simply who weren't uh, con uh, affiliated with the, the brands with which Rolex worked, could access something with a helium escape valve, and as a result would be able to work despite their use of, of more modern saturation diving. Of course, as with previous doxers, it perhaps wasn't the most delicate or indeed the most, uh, most subtle of watches, but then aesthetics were really of no relevance in this period because these watches were purely tools and the, the collector market for this kind of thing didn't exist. So these were very much watches that were worn simply for the purpose. And so as a result, it was an extremely interesting watch with a very impressive new technology. Now the other school of thought with regards to solving this problem of helium entering a watch case and then forcefully releasing itself through the crystal was that taken by Omega with the Ploprof. And this watch was released um, between 1970 and 1971. It's agreed that it was only available to purchase or to access in April 1971, but some have said that it's, it was actually seen before in 1970. And in terms of this watch's uh, build, it was a pretty unique design, because it was released alongside the Seamaster 1000, which was also a, a more conventional version of this, uh, this dive watch. But focusing on the 600 meter version, this watch had a very peculiar case, with the crown often placed on the left-hand side of the case, whereas it was also available on the other side um, in the conventional position, but I think it tended to, to be seen on the opposite side due to its sheer size. And as you can see, it has this bizarre, almost spaceship style of, um, of, of, sh of shape, with a, a very tall and very easily gripped bezel placed atop it, which is fully graduated around the side, and of course a dark blue dial with those hands in orange and in white. Now, whilst nowadays this watch isn't nearly as valuable as the Rolex Sea Dweller, I do feel this watch certainly deserves its place in history, because it's one of the most innovative dive watches ever created in my eyes, and whilst perhaps it's not wearable on a daily, uh, on a daily, um, daily, daily basis, it's certainly an incredible piece. Now, in terms of its build, it's, it's made of stainless steel and, of course, is built in a very, in a very different way in order to enable it to, uh, to not have a helium escape valve. Now, it has a monoblock construction, so the case back and the rest of the case are a single piece, meaning the movement has to be dropped in through the front of the watch um, well, after one's removed the bezel. And what this meant was that the watch could, could, uh, could survive um, being in a, in a helium-enriched environment without the danger of it actually entering the case. It was said that this watch was a hundred times more airtight than the Apollo space capsule. Furthermore, the crown was square and mounted to the case via this locking nut, which screwed down. And through this technique, it allowed the, 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 the gasket inside the crown to be compressed flat and not twisted as it was screwed in, thus uh, increasing its, its life. And the effect of this was to make the watch not water resistant to the stated 600 meters, but to over 1370 meters. And the reason for this was because the crystal itself was supported by a, a plastic and metal uh, sort of uh, ring that went around the dial and the movement and was braced against the case back. And so as the pressure increased, the, the crystal was compressed into the watch and it was at 1370 meters without a leak that the crystal touched the hands and stopped the movement. But as far as the case itself was concerned, no water had entered, making this a truly incredible design. Matched by those incredibly legible hands with that plongeur style, with the orange minute hand, the white hour hand, and of course that uh, dark blue dial base, it was a very, very legible watch, in addition to the use of that button in red to, to, uh, to release the bezel 
and allow you to turn it freely in both directions, which enabled it to be easier to set with gloves on and also much faster to set because it turned both ways. This watch was joined in the range, of course, by the Seamaster 1000, which had the Flight Master style of case, and not this uh, quintessentially um, uh, exotic 70s style of Seamaster case. It also didn't have the push-button bezel, but had a more conventional style, but was rated to 1000 meters, not 600, though I don't know if any comparative um, tests have been done to see which one actually was more water-resistant with its case design. But both had fully luminous acrylic bezels, and of course used the Caliber 1002 by Omega, in this, uh, this generation of, of style of, uh, of dive watch. And as though proof of how competent these watches were, they were used during the Comex Janus II mission in 1970, where uh, Heliox was used, and, and the watches went down to 255 meters, a very impressive depth for these watches, and indeed showed their, uh, their diving credentials. Now the fourth direction from which these incredible dive watches of the 70s came was Japan, and from Seiko, in fact. And Seiko was a brand which had been boosted, in fact, by the 1969 release of their Seiko Astron in the world of quartz watches. But where mechanical watches were concerned, their, uh, their developments were quite interesting through the 60s. Their first dive watch was, of course, the famous 62 MAS, of which you now see on the screen the remake for 2017, um, which was produced just about a year ago, in terms of being a, uh, a sort of a re-edition of this incredible 150 meter water-resistant watch. And this was a very simple design, it was very much at the origin of Seiko. But after this watch, they moved towards a direction which was far more recognisable. The crown was moved to four o'clock, and the case design was, uh, was something which was to become quintessentially of their brand. And so the dive watches went in two directions. There were the 150 meter models, which were the 6105s, which went towards the sort of uh, skin diving, um, low water resistance uh, market. But then, then, of course, there were their professional divers designed for deep-sea diving and for far more expensive applications. Seiko's pursuit, though, of professional diving began in 1967 with the, the rather mysteriously um, under-discussed 6215-010. This was a 300-metre dive watch, which, uh, which was a monoblock case designer, had these wonderful sides with these fantastic sharp edges and wonderful polishing. However, it's really the, the, uh, the 1968-6159-7001 that sticks in the mind. This piece was an updated version of that 67 watch, with, with, with the same 300 meter water resistance and a very similar 44mm monoblock case, which was in addition to their use of Hardlex crystal, which was superior to the plexiglass crystal of the period, and of course it also housed a 36,000 vibration per hour high beat automatic Grand Seiko movement, which was an incredibly impressive addition to this technical dive watch, and, and really did spark the direction for Seiko's uh, evolution as far as these, these technical watches went. However, there was a problem with this watch, because uh, a, a diver contacted Seiko complaining of the fact that his Seiko had jettisoned its crystal upon decompression. And Seiko took this extremely seriously, and it took them seven years to resolve the problem under the leadership of Ikuo Tokunaga. And so in 1975, the watch that Seiko released was the world-famous Tuna. And the reference for this is the 6159-7010. And this had an immense 51mm titanium monoblock case, which was a world first, in fact, because titanium was very difficult to machine in the period and to, um, to, to produce to this standard. Of course, it was never a very, uh, a very handsome-looking watch, at least to, uh, to those who were looking at it for its aesthetic form and not its technical function. But it's a piece which was able to create something of, a, of an icon in the world of dive watches, which hasn't really been emulated to any major degree by any other brand. And it also continued this, uh, this route of world firsts with the addition of a ceramic coated titanium shroud, which as you can see on this version had a, um, a sort of a lip which went out over the, the, the lugs themselves, which was something which made this original watch, which is often referred to as the grandfather tuner, appear all the larger by comparison to, to other uh, Seiko tuners. Now inside it, there was the high beat automatic movement uh, used um, in the, the previous iteration of the 6159. However, protecting it were new L-shaped gaskets, which were also a world first, around that front of the watch. And the timepiece with its monoblock case took the same approach as the Seamaster 600 and Seamaster 1000. This was a watch which simply wouldn't let the helium in. In 1978, though, Seiko produced what was really quite a groundbreaking piece. This was the 7549-7009, which had actually the same case design and size as its, its uh, forefather in 1975. 
The difference was that because its shroud no longer had the lips that extended over the edge of the, um, the, 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 the lugs, and indeed over the, the end of the strap, it was able to drop down to just over 49mm instead of just shy of 50, uh, sorry, 51 on the, the previous version. Now, they produced a few developments with this watch, such as the fact that it was now a day-date um, watch as opposed to simply having the date, and also it was now quartz. Of course, quartz was still a relatively young technology, and so quartz was by no means cheap in this period, um, and so as a result, quartz was viewed actually as an upgrade, not as a downgrade. And the reason for the use of quartz, whilst the water resistance didn't change, was that it made a much more robust watch. And uh, talking of the case first of all, it was now this golden-coloured nitride-plated titanium, and the reason for this was that it made it more resilient to the elements, and so as a result it gained this golden colour as a byproduct of this process. In addition to this, the quartz movements were much, much more accurate than contemporary automatic movements, and this was also added to by the general fact that these quartzes were more reliable to knocks as well, in addition to magnetism, whilst they also had an end-of-life indicator to show when, the, uh, when the, the movement was running low on battery, and so as to send it back to Seiko. And so the reason why I've included this watch in the video is because really this is the watch which changed the direction in which these, uh, these dive watches went, in terms of uh, fo focusing purely upon the technical function as a result of this, uh, this quartz technology, and directing the, um, the attention of the buyer towards something new, as these truly were technical watches, and nothing more. In the same year, 1978, as that Seiko was released, Rolex uh, produced a watch which would, uh, would stand them at the pinnacle of dive watches for many years to come, and this was the reference uh, 1660, which was the new Sea Dweller. And the new Sea Dweller had doubled the water resistance, despite keeping the, the size the same, um, aside from the, the thickness, to 4,000 feet or 1,200 meters. In addition to that, um, they quickly gained uh, sapphire crystals, and also, um, despite early models still having painted uh, matte dials, quickly developed uh, glossy styles of dials um, with the more modern applied indices to the surface of the dial, Admittedly, um, this, this was a bit of a, a change for the original Rolex dial, whilst the triangle at 12 o'clock was shortened a bit, but this really did bring them into the modern age of dive watches. The watch was also updated with a new movement, the calibre 3035, which kept the automatic winding, but, uh, but also added the use of a quick-set date, and increased the beat rate to just be a, a more complete package, and a more modern movement to the, the calibre um, 1575 used in the previous uh, Sea Dweller. With this newfound technical prowess, the watch was very quickly tested, and, uh, and it re really reached its peak in the late 80s and early 90s, where in 1988 it was, uh, it was taken down to, to 534 metres below sea level by Comex divers through the use of Heliox and Hydreliox. And uh, really is an incredible depth, bearing in mind this, uh, th this is a watch which one can wear every day. It, it's perfectly wearable, bearing in mind its shape, its form, but can resist that sort of pressure. Of course, it has also been tested to greater depth. For example, there was the 1992 dive to 701 metres, which admittedly wasn't done in the sea. It was done in a, um, a hyperbaric chamber on land, but nonetheless was used underwater in pools during these tests, and shows just the sheer resilience of this watch to such immense pressure. And now, whilst it's certainly true that a great deal of the, the highly technical dive watches of the 1960s and 70s had really petered out by the late 80s to the early 90s, Seiko came back to, to match the Rolex Sea Dweller, which in its, um, its, uh, two th its 4,000 foot form lasted for about 30 years. Seiko came out in 1986 with the 7C46-7009, which has really defined what the modern tuner is, which is a 1,000 meter dive watch with a similar sized case as previous iterations. However, this time the quartz has been updated to their 7C46 line, with a five-year power reserve, and of course all the technical uh, um, prowess and technical uh, know-how that Seiko had put into their former watches. And so as a result, these, um, the, these, these tuners remain fairly unchanged, and to the present day one sees the occasional hand change, and certainly dimensions have changed. But for a great deal of time these watches remained the technical dive watches, and even today remain the technical dive watches they always were meant to be, in terms of, uh, of not going for a smaller size, or indeed going for any, any slightly more, more decorated versions, because these are truly professional dive watches to be used for a technical purpose. And so whilst for a few years there, there weren't any particularly groundbreaking dive watches, in terms of presenting a, a higher water resistance, or a technical purpose which was, uh, was new and, and superlative, the Rolex uh, Sea Dweller Deep Sea, released in 2008, ended the 30-year reign of the 1200-meter Sea Dweller. And of course that watch did come back a few years later in the form of the Ceramic Sea Dweller, 
um, Seedweller 4000 in fact, because that watch didn't increase the water resistance or, or change it in, in, in a particularly impressive way, this is the watch I'd like to focus on. And of course with the Deep Sea came a truly incredible technical package, because it retained the 904L stainless steel case used by Rolex for its uh, resistance to corrosion, but also featured a titanium case back and used this new ring lock system, which is similar to that used in the, um, the Seamaster um, 600 or the Ploprof of the 70s, surrounded the movement and dial and supported the crystal against the case back, thus preventing it from being crushed under the immense pressure. However, whilst the achievements of the Deep Sea with its near 4000 meter water resistance are, uh, are, are, are incredible, quite frankly, and the fact that this is probably the most, uh, the most uh, successful and most impressive of the automatic dive watches of the 21st century, one other watch has perhaps an even more incredible CV from Rolex, and that's the watch that was produced in 2012 for the second dive to the bottom of the Challenger Deep, the same place as the, uh, the 1960 dive which Rolex was also involved with. Mounted to the outside of James Cameron's famous Deep Sea Challenger submersible, the Rolex Deep Sea Challenge was a true monster. This watch is 51.4mm in diameter by 28.5mm thick, and the incredible thing about this watch is it's able to resist 12,000 metres of pressure. And this is without using some of the albeit extremely clever technology that uh, Zinn, for example, and Bell and Ross have used by using quartz watches that are then filled with oil. This watch is a purely mechanical, um, automatic dive watch. In many ways, it's very similar to the standard uh, Deep Sea with the, the Calibre 3135 inside it, but of course with an enlarged case with that titanium build. It also doesn't have a helium escape valve, as of course this is of no help to a dive watch of this type, which is to be worn outside the, um, the submersible at all times, and won't actually be used in any sort of decompression. What of course I do find rather ironic about this watch is that it's been built to resemble a sea dweller, unlike the, the original Deep Sea Special of that, um, that 1953 and 1960 uh, set of dives. This watch has a rotating bezel, it has a usable crown, it looks like a Rolex which is quite remarkable, bearing in mind this watch was able to resist that pressure, and is visible uh, in, uh, in videos, in fact, on the, uh, the, the arm, the, the hydraulic um, uh, arm of the, uh, the, 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 sub the submersible itself, which is quite incredible to see, and, uh, and is incredible, bearing in mind the fact the watch is able to resist a 13.6 tonne load on the front of it. And the final note I'd like to finish on is that uh, whilst one often hears about watches which are pressure tested to their, uh, their, their, their limits, and of course um, that is, is recorded as their, um, their, their pass in terms of the amount of water resistance they have. The, uh, the one event which I think is quite remarkable is that in 2014 Seiko um, took four tuner models, these are the 1000 meter Marine Masters, two of which were quartz and two of which were automatic, and they attached them to a submersible and lowered them into the sea. And the incredible thing is that despite the fact that these watches are rated to 1000 meters, the quartz versions only stopped at 3,284 metres, whilst the automatic stopped at 4,299, showing just the incredible level of, of overbuilt technology these watches are, are made with, and just how much care they're designed with to be able to cre create something truly superlative in the world of dive watches. And I will in fact link the video down below so that you can take a look yourself, because it's quite a remarkable watch uh, that uh, Seiko put on YouTube. And so I will conclude the video here, despite the fact that I have left out quite a few things in terms of the, the evolution of the dive watch, but I hope I've covered all the, the, the most interesting points in terms of the parts which really show a, a mastery of technology over the natural elements. And so do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of this uh, two-part um, um, two piece on the history of the dive watch, because it is such a complex history, but a fascinating one nonetheless. And so if you did enjoy the video, then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel and to be able to enjoy more content here in the future. So thank you very much for watching. This is Arm on the Watch Guy, out.